Good morning, everyone, uh, far and near. Welcome to Keel Street this morning as we celebrate Christ once again. And as over this weekend, we in Canada celebrate Canada Day. Uh, would you be with me as I stand with me here in the chapel as I read Scripture, as we read the Scripture? For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day you've given us today. A day, Lord, that we can gather and worship you. We can praise you and, Lord, we can learn more about you as, as Grant will come later to preach. Just be with this day that we will know that you are God. In your son's name I pray, amen.
shine, I ask my Lord if you must mind. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. You're the river, the chill and cold, the chill the body, but not the soul. There is but one way for this trial. Trust to heaven and right back. Every time I think it is every time I need a lost me, I will pray. Every time we will pray. Every time I will pray. Every time I will pray. Every time I pray. chair in front of you, somewhere around you, page 898, John chapter 4. As you turn there, I want you to think about uh, grace for a moment. Now, we often identify grace with the free gift of salvation given by faith in Christ, made possible through his sacrifice on the cross. But the, the gift of grace doesn't end with our salvation. Our salvation is, is only the beginning of the gift of God's grace in our lives. Grace is a state or a condition we live in as followers of Christ. Grace is God's power and God's intention at work in our lives. On Father's Day, I preached a message from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In that passage, we, we get a wonderful insight into the grace of which we're talking about when Paul gives a very personal look into his life. Paul suffered from something that he called his thorn in the flesh. Paul tells us that he prayed three times for God to remove the thorn and three times the Lord said no. I don't know about you, but the fact that God said no to Paul kind of makes me feel a little bit better. Because uh, we're in good company when God says no to us as well. Paul suffered, God said no, but then we have this amazing thing, the reason why the Lord said no. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And we talked about that, like I said, two weeks ago. So, but, but let's look at it a little bit differently. What do we learn about grace from this passage? Well, first of all, God's grace is sufficient. It's all we need. It's enough. There are times when we may not think it's enough. There are times when it doesn't feel like it's enough. But the Lord says it is indeed enough. The Greek behind the word the NIV translates as sufficient refers to strength. The idea is that God's grace is strong enough to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Jesus says, my grace is strong enough to get the job done. Secondly, grace does not remove the problem. It doesn't always remove the problem. Paul keeps his thorn. Paul must deal with the thorn. Paul must work with the thorn. If we put one and two together, we could say that God's grace is strong enough to help us overcome the problems and trials that we face in our lives. Our problems may not be removed, but God, through his work of grace in our lives, will give us strength to overcome, to work through, to deal with whatever it is that we're facing. And third, grace is unleashed through our weakness. This kind of living, coping, overcoming grace 
is to be released in our lives as we acknowledge our weakness. Jesus tells Paul that his gracious power is perfected or it will accomplish its work, it will complete its work in the context of our coming to terms with our weakness. To put it another way, God's grace allows us to accept God's help by admitting we need it. Keep all of this background in mind as we jump into John 4. Beginning with verse 4 we read, Now he had to go through Samaria, he being Jesus, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Let's stop there. Notice how verse 4 begins. It says, Jesus had to go through Samaria. You could simply take this to mean that, that Jesus had to go through Samaria because he was traveling from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. Going through Samaria was the most direct route. But unless a Jew was in a big hurry, they would never consider going through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan, go up the other side, and then come back over the Jordan into Galilee. The reason was simple for this. Jews and Samaritans hated one another. <laughs> Jews looked down on the Samaritans as a contaminated race of people, a contaminated religion that was practiced, and Samaritans despised Jews as self-righteous elitists. They were divided by religious hostility. Jews worshipped in Jerusalem on the original site of Solomon's temple, and the Samaritans established a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, the site of the original tabernacle. And we get a glimpse of this common attitude of the Jews towards the Samaritans when in John 8, 48, the Pharisees, angered by Jesus' teaching, blurted out this accusation against him. They said, you Samaritan devil, didn't we sail along that you were possessed by a demon? You know, I guess it wasn't enough just to call Jesus a devil. <laughs> they had to come up with something even more insulting than being a devil. And the modifier they picked was Samaritan. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't have the same prejudice as his people did at the time, so he wouldn't have had a problem just heading north through Samaria. But I think there's something more intended here when John tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. There's a sense of destiny, of purpose in this. I mean, if John was just telling us that the route that Jesus was taking to Galilee uh, was through Samaria, wouldn't he have just written, Jesus went through Samaria to Galilee? But he doesn't. John is telling us something about the trip. There's something intentional about Jesus' trip through Samaria. Ultimately, I think it's reasonable con to conclude that Jesus had penciled in his, in his appointment book a meeting with this woman from Sychar. The woman that he will meet at this well. So Jesus ends up in Sychar, tired from the hard two days walk. Then he sends his disciples into town to get food. We find Jesus alone in Samaria. It wasn't very often that Jesus was alone. Jesus was only alone when he wanted to be alone. But even so, I gather that Jesus had to do a bit of persuading to send his disciples on their way. After all, they were in what they considered to be hostile territory. You generally don't leave your master alone in Gentile territory, or in hostile territory, I should say. Some of them should have stayed back with Jesus, just in case. Or Jesus should have gone in the town with them. But as Jesus would say after the disciples returned to him, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The reason Jesus sets up this present scenario with the woman at the well was that it had to do with something that 
was connected to the will of the Father to finish his work. So, so Jesus purposely shows up in Sychar at the well at noontime, and he makes sure that he's alone. It was probably the fact that it was noontime and no one would be at the well that convinced the disciples that Jesus could be left on his own. And yet, surprisingly, at least to us, a woman shows up at the well. You know, Jesus purposely came to Samaria to give the woman he knew he would meet at the well his personal undivided attention. You know, think about that. Don't, don't rush by it. Jesus took the, the effort. He, he trekked the journey. He made time for someone no one else wanted to know. He traveled two days' journey to meet with someone most people wouldn't cross the road for unless it was to avoid them. Picking up the story with verse 7, we read, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know, it's hard for us to understand how truly out of the ordinary Jesus' question was. You know, first, he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. That was enough to suggest that there would be no dialogue between these two whatsoever, even if she were a Samaritan man, let alone a Samaritan woman. Just wasn't done in that culture. Jesus was crossing lines of several cultural taboos here. You can see it in a reply. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? If we were to paraphrase her comment, it would be something like, are you crazy? Now, the parenthetical statement at the end of verse 9, which the NIV translates as, for the Jews do not associate with Samaritans, can be equally translated as, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. That puts a little bit of a different spin on it. The Greek word translated associated in the NIV literally means to share the use of. So for a Jew to, to share a cup with a Samaritan would be to commit an act that would make them unclean, at least as far as their culture was concerned. So no wonder this woman is perplexed by Jesus' request. There, there's something else going on here that we need to notice. There was a well closer to Sychar than the well described in this passage. The, the woman had to walk by a well to get to this well. She had to go by her local well to go to another well. And she did it at noontime, when the temperature was at its hottest. Women usually got water in the evening, not at noontime. And they would normally go to the well closest to their home, obviously. You know, remember to get water from a well wasn't like turning on the tap. It was heavy work. We're talking about clay pots filled with water. So the question is, why did she go past the closest, most convenient well to get her water at the hottest, hardest time of day. The answer had to be that the extra physical discomfort she put herself through was preferable to the social discomfort that came from meeting anyone else from her community at the well. This woman had lived a life that made her want to be invisible because she already felt invisible. She wanted to be invisible, but that doesn't stop Jesus from, from intentionally seeking her out. Jesus just, just happens to be at this out of the way well in the scorching noontime heat by himself in a culturally hostile environment, and then he proceeds to break a bunch of cultural taboos by beginning a conversation with this woman. This is big stuff here. Here we get a glimpse of God at work. Jesus is purposely extending himself to an outcast member of an outcast culture. If you were looking for the most broken, most marginalized member of an already marginalized people, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone else who would be more perfect in meeting those requirements than this woman at the well. 
But isn't that what Jesus is famous for? Touching the untouchables, seeing the invisible, welcoming the outcast, moving towards and meeting the marginalized. Jesus constantly outraged the religious leaders of his day by hanging out with people they viewed as spiritual riffraff. It was this kind of association that got him labeled as a glutton and a drunkard. Eventually, they simply called him by a name they considered the ultimate put-down. But I think Jesus wore the name as a badge of honor. He was just simply called a friend of sinners. Okay, so far we have a meeting between a woman who was doing everything she could to hide and a, and a man who by all rights shouldn't have been there and he certainly shouldn't have been talking to her and we're still asking her for a drink. Already the woman has to be taken in by the uniqueness of the situation, but Jesus works hard to draw her in and make her even more engaged in conversation. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked me and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this, this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. How can you not be drawn into a conversation with Jesus? Notice what, what Jesus offers her. He, he doesn't offer her advice he doesn't tell her what to do. He offers her himself. Jesus offers her a gift from God himself, a, a gift he calls living water, a, a gift welling up to eternal life. So what is living water? In the context of John, we've gone through John recently, it has everything wrapped up in his hour that was to come. Or the reason why Jesus came into our human context it's the gift of the Holy Spirit made possible through him being lifted up on the cross and dying for our sins. All of that together. It's the reality of a new creation, of a, of a recreation established by him, in him. In his sacrifice, in his perfection, in his righteousness, in his love, in his obedience to the Father. In other words, it is the offer of God's all-sufficient grace. Isaiah 55 gives us some background context into what Jesus is offering the woman at the well. You can be sure that, that he's thinking about this verse as he speaks to her. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the water. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. What an amazing image of grace. The promise of a satisfied, sustaining life without hunger, without thirst, without cost. At least cost to the person who's receiving it. In the book of Jeremiah, God says, My people have committed two, sin, two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. God himself is living water. Dependence upon him is drinking in the living water, doing your own thing, depending on your own strength. Living according to your own righteousness, righteousness is drinking water from something that can't hold water at all. God himself is the living water. Jesus is promising himself. He's promising a satisfying, refreshing relationship with him freely given by his efforts alone you can't help but see that Jesus is reaching out to this woman trying to be as winsome and as gentle and as interesting as he can be he wants to connect with her he, he wants to help her he, he cares about her he has come to Samaria because of her But she isn't quite sure what to do with Jesus. She's listening, but she's not hearing, at least completely. 
she's missing out on the spiritual element, element of what Jesus is offering her, and, and just seeing the fact that she'd love to not come to the well every day. But in the very least, she's there and she's talking to him and she's listening. I wonder when she had her last meaningful conversation with another person, particularly with someone who treated her with as much respect as Jesus did. When was the last time someone was interested in her instead of being interested in using her? Jesus then does something risky. Well, he already has, but this time something else that's risky, but necessary. Beginning with verse 16, we read, He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. After Jesus offers her living water, he drops a bomb of sorts. <laughs> he asks about her husband. He asks about the very thing that brought her so much shame. The thing that scarred her, the thing that identified her within the community as a non-human, as a non-person. She had five husbands and she was living with a sixth man who was not her husband. The specific term John uses for the man suggests that he was not considered her husband because he was still married to someone else. He was someone else's husband. This kind of batting record is still outside the parameters of societal acceptance today. But in Jesus' day, it was unheard of. Her life exhibited the combined scars of tragic circumstances and foolish choices. We don't know if she went through five husbands because of decisions she made or because of five, five different men grew tired of her or maybe a few of them died along the way. We don't know. What we do know is that life had been a struggle for this woman. And thanks to a small town sidecar where everyone knew everyone else's business, she was the object of scorn and shame particularly in an honor-shame culture. Now, we know why she walked past the closer, more popular well in the hottest time of the day to get her water. She couldn't deal with the shame. She couldn't deal with what other people thought of her. She couldn't deal with what her reputation had become. She couldn't deal with her life. Her relationship betrayed a life of deep thirst for love, clearly, for acceptance, for companionship. But with each attempt, she just got thirstier. She was broken and as hopeless as you can get. I would have loved to have been there to hear the way Jesus said these words. Jesus doesn't avoid her sin. How can he? Avoiding sin doesn't bring healing can't bring healing. Pointing to the problem with a judgmental heart without a judgmental heart is necessary. Jesus' motivation is to help, not to judge. To embrace, not to point fingers. He's trying to give her living water. His words aren't harsh. His words aren't accusatory. Instead, they're just full of understanding and truth. Of course, that doesn't make the subject any more comfortable for her. <laughs> so she changes the subject. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. <laughs> I just love that one. Uh, how do you know what you know? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but... You Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You almost have to laugh at her com comment. You see, Sir, I see you're a prophet. We can paraphrase her words with, How do you know so much about me? Have you been stalking me? 
then she changes the subject. She, you can see the gears working in her mind. She's a very smart woman. So she thinks to herself, let me see, he's a Jew, let's talk about temple wars. That's what I'll talk about. That'll change the subject. That'll get a conversation going and away from me. Jews love to tell Samaritans about how wrong they are in worshiping on Mount Gerizim. So that should get him suitably off topic. You know, I've seen this kind of ploy happen lots before. You start talking to someone about their need for living water and suddenly they start asking about whether you really believe in creationism or if Adam and Eve were real or what you think about Noah or the ark or if Jonah really did have a whale of a time. It's much easier to talk about theology than it is to talk about the things that are inside us that are broken and in need of living water. Even even us who know better often live on the surface of things and we don't go deeper. Well, you you know what happens next. We have Jesus' famous remarks about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. But for the purpose of today's message, let's jump to verse 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. What an amazing conversation. (laughs) Repeatedly, the religious leaders tried to get Jesus to openly declare his identity, and he refuses. But to a Samaritan woman at a well, he declares that he is indeed the Messiah. This is why he had to, had to come to Samaria. This was his plan. He came to give her living water. He came to reveal himself to her. He came to help her redefine and redesign her life. But now it was up to her. She had to make a choice. She had to choose to either believe Jesus' claims or reject it. Thankfully, he had given her a little bit of information that helped her tip the scale in one direction or another. He knew everything about her. And he still loved her. Who other than God can be someone who does that? And it's at this point the disciples return. And look at Jesus. And then they look at the woman. And then they look at each other. And then they look at the ground. This is one of those moments that's just too weird to comment on or ask about. This situation is so weird that even Peter doesn't say anything. The woman leaves her jar behind and she runs into town and she does something that she's probably not done since husband two or three. She starts talking to people. She she runs up to them. She starts talking about this this Jesus who knew everything about her. I want to pause for a moment and and let, let that statement sink in. He knew everything about her. If Jesus had been judgmental or critical with his words towards this woman, how would she have responded to him? Would she respond to him like this? Would she have responded to the people in her village in the way that she did? No. She would have just been more broken. Jesus' words restored her. They didn't accuse her. They they were not of the type of quality that she had been used to all of her life. They were necessary words, true words, but they were also words that were motivated by love, designed to give hope. Jesus knew everything about her, but he still talked to her. He still offered her living water. He still offered her eternal life. He still revealed himself to her. He still revealed himself to a woman no one else would talk to. He revealed himself to a woman that no one would even marry. Her marrying days were gone. He revealed himself to an outcast woman from an outcast people. And instead of condemning her or ignoring her or treating her, With contempt, he treats her with love and respect. Oh, we can learn so much 
from Jesus and his attitude. What is it that changed this woman from someone who was so broken that she went to the well in the heat of the day to avoid other women in her town to, to someone who runs up to people and tells them about Jesus? I mean, that's an about face. That's a complete change in behavior and attitude. What is it? Was it that her life was any different? No. Were the opinions of the people around her any different? No. Well, then what changed? Her circumstances didn't. The people's opinion of her didn't. The only thing that changed had to be herself somehow. She had changed because of her encounter with Jesus. Because someone finally showed some interest and some concern and some respect for her. And then offered her eternal life. Somehow meeting with Jesus didn't erase any of the bad stuff in her life. But he did enable her to face her life and deal with it. Think about that. Somehow she was no longer trapped or defined by her failure and fear. In fact, now she had the freedom to openly talk about her life. Come and see Jesus. He knows everything about me. Everything. And he still gave me living water. I believe he is the Messiah. I, I couldn't hide from him. And for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel like I had to hide from him either. Do you feel like hiding from Jesus sometimes? If you do, you need to spend more time with him. You need to let your picture of him be shaped by scripture and not your own thoughts or the thoughts of the culture around you. You need to allow him to tell you everything that he knows about you and still receive his love and acceptance. She found peace and joy despite all that she had been through. Peace that was disconnected from her unpeaceful surroundings, her unpeaceful life. Peace that connected deeply with her soul. Her circumstances hadn't changed, but she had changed. She had found a peace that Paul describes as the peace which surpasses all understanding. A peace that you shouldn't have if you think about it. But you do have it because of your faith. Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient every day, all the time. Jesus offered the woman at the will living water, which would be a constant source of new life, helping her to overcome the old life. This was grace strong enough to carry her through a life that had previously been crippled by her sin, despair, marginalization, and shame. But this kind of grace doesn't come to us automatically. In fact, I believe that there are all kinds of Christians who have received God's grace through faith in Jesus for salvation, but, but they don't have this living kind of carry you through grace. It's available to us. Why is that? Well, as we found out in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians carry you through grace is only unleashed when we recognize our weakness. The Lord says that his power is made perfect in weakness. Grace requires that we acknowledge our weakness. Notice what Paul says immediately after this revelation from God. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul says, Lord, you need me to acknowledge my weakness? No problem. You got it. I will surrender whatever you need me to surrender in order that your power might rest on me. What an amazing attitude. 
The woman at the well may not have been quite as open as Paul, but she admitted the source of her weakness. It was all about the compromises, the, the hurts, the sins that festered in her relationship with men. I don't have a husband, she said. These five words represent everything that had brought her life to this place of defeat. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying she needed a husband to be happy. That's not true. The meaning of I don't have a husband in her specific case was that she had given up. What she had been looking for didn't work. So she had just stopped looking. She acknowledged the thirst that characterized her life had never been quenched. And with that acknowledgement came room for living water that satisfies. The writer of Hebrews encourages us to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let me ask you a question. How often do you pray for grace and mercy in your time of need? If you're like me, I'm much more likely to pray for changed circumstances. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, I don't deserve this. Lord, take away my pain. Lord, rescue me. Lord, smite my enemies. I don't pray that too often, but occasionally. Lord, rescue me, I pray a lot. I tend to pray for the need, not the mercy and grace to carry me through the problem. What about you? Don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with praying that God might take away your thorn. But the question is, do we ever pray to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need? Do we ever pray, Lord, Lord, help me through what, I, I, I've, what I've got to go through? Because I know there's no other option. I have to go through it. Do we ever pray, Lord, give me the grace to overcome what life is throwing at me? Lord, I am weak. I need help. I can't do it. I need your living water. I need your grace that is sufficient. Help me to know your grace is sufficient. One of the foundational things we must do as Christians is embrace our reality, not hide from it. Grace enables us to do that, by the way. We can't overcome what we refuse to face. We can't become strong until we admit our weaknesses. But it's so hard because our culture teaches us to hide our weaknesses. Our culture engages us to, to compensate and make excuses for our weaknesses. But Jesus encourages us to acknowledge our weaknesses and then cling to him for the grace to function despite them. Think about it this way. When you acknowledge you are weak, you're inviting your Savior to be strong through you. And he's much better at being strong through you than you are at being strong in yourself. A lot of our prayers are wrapped up in promises to God that you know we can do better or that we'll try harder or I can't believe I did that again. But, but these are weak prayers because they're based on the illusion that we're strong. How do we show Yahweh that we understand what he did for us through Jesus? We do it by acknowledging that the living water he has provided is sufficient to satisfy our deepest thirsts. How thankful are you for grace? Specifically, how thankful are you for the carry you through grace that we've been talking about today? As we come to the Lord's table, let's start praying. Heavenly Father, I cannot, but you can. I cannot, but you can. In my weakness, be my strength. Be specific, Father, I cannot fill in the blank. But you can. 
Help me in my weakness. Give me the grace I need in this time of my need. Acknowledging and claiming your need for Jesus, sacrifice saves you. Meeting Jesus in the waters of baptism declares him by faith to be the one who knows everything about you, but who can still rescue you, just like the woman at the well. It's the beginning of finding new life, but it doesn't end there. If you haven't made the first steps and want to know more, come and see me after the service. But, but for all of us who have believed already, we still must continually admit our weakness. That's why we meet at the Lord's table every week. We admit our weakness, our need, our sin, and we ask for living water that we may never thirst again. Remember that Jesus didn't offer the woman at the well a solution, a teaching, a life hack. He didn't tell her to shape up and get with the program. He simply offered her himself. He revealed himself, and that changed her. It, 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 it brought her something that no one else could, that nothing else could. God's grace is enough. Our circumstances might not change. How people look at us might not change. But God's grace is enough to change us. Knowing Jesus is enough. Do you believe that? If you don't, pray, Lord, help my unbelief. Worship team. This is my revelation, Christ Jesus crucified. A salvation through repentance at the cross on which he died.
tells us as often as we meet around this table, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. We proclaim the Lord's sufficiency until the sufficiency is completed. As you go out this week, if you feel sidelined, if you feel ostracized, if you feel shame, come to him. Come to his people. Find the love that is uniquely God's, uniquely healing, uniquely empowering to overcome and walk through. Thank you.